Good afternoon and welcome to today's HydroCAD webinar. My name is Peter Smart. I'm the developer of HydroCAD and I will be the presenter this afternoon. Uh, today we're going to be talking about reviewing HydroCAD projects. And this session is intended partly for reviewers, perhaps agency folks, who are receiving HydroCAD projects that have been submitted to them. And we'll be talking about a range of issues uh, of interest to reviewers. But this session will also be of use to anyone who's preparing a HydroCAD project because we'll be giving you some tips and some guidance on what you can do to set up your project in order to make them as readable and understandable to, to anyone who may be reviewing them. And of course, the easier it is for someone to understand your project, the, the more likely it is that it's going to be reviewed and hopefully approved in a timely manner. Our primary goal here is, is to encourage clear communication between engineers and reviewers in, in the use of the software. Uh, in the, the next hour, we're going to be talking about uh, roughly five, six basic topics. One of the first is what is HydroCAD used for? Uh, essentially, what calculations does it employ? What kind of choices are available to the engineer? What's it suitable for? What isn't it suitable for? Uh, then we will be talking in a little more detail about exchanging HydroCAD information, the different ways you might submit a project file or share it with someone else. We'll be talking about looking at actual HydroCAD project files and also about reports, be they printed reports or PDF reports or other ways that you might transmit that information. Then we'll talk about working with HydroCAD project files directly, how you would open a HydroCAD file, examine the contents, explore the results, and we'll be talking about the full HydroCAD program versus the HydroCAD sampler, which is available to reviewers and others. We'll get into exploring HydroCAD projects in a little bit more detail, exactly what's in the reports, uh, how to gather additional information about specific items that you may have questions on, and we'll talk about some common calculation issues, uh, different procedures used for calculating runoff and routing hydrographs, different rainfall issues, uh, and some of the, the more nitty-gritty matters of, of how your project is set up that affect your results, things that reviewers should be looking for. So that's a basic overview of what we'll be covering in the session. And uh, do type in any questions in the question or chat window as we go along, and we will try to get to those as time permits. So the first topic I want to get into in a little bit more detail uh, is what is HydroCAD used for? The primary intent of HydroCAD is for projects that would normally or originally have been done with the TR-20 or TR-55 uh, approaches. Uh, as you, I'm sure you know, these were developed by SCS, now NRCS, and HydroCAD was the first model to provide an easy desktop solution to implement the full unit hydrograph procedure that's in TR-20. And it continues to provide, we believe, a, a much easier to use alternative to, to these public domain products. Um, but that's the essential criteria for when is HydroCAD appropriate. Anywhere you would use the SCS or NRCS method is generally an appropriate scenario for using HydroCAD. HydroCAD can also be used for rational method and the SBH procedure, the Santa Barbara Urban Hydrograph. So we do go a little bit wider than, than just the SCS and NRCS procedures. Um, but that's still the basis of, of our, our, our goal. Uh, it's important to understand that HydroCAD is a hydrograph routing model. That what we are doing is routing time-varying flows through a system. This is in contrast to a steady-state analysis uh, where you are assuming that the whole system is at equilibrium. And th that's a very important distinction. There are some projects, uh, perhaps most significantly certain storm sewer systems, which you are just going to assess under a steady-state scenario, <coughs> typically with rational method. And in those cases, you probably want a specific storm sewer program that does steady state. Uh, you can do some steady state analysis in HydroCAD, but you're going to tend to find it's overkill. Again, we're dealing with a time varying flow, a hydrograph. And wherever you have storage effects in a system, such as detention ponds uh, and other volume effects, you do need to route hydrographs. So that is our emphasis. HydroCAD also provides capability for routing those hydrographs, obviously through ponds, through catch basins, pipes, reaches, uh, a whole range of different hydrograph capabilities are available. Um, 
there is a comparison chart that we have available on our website, which gives you a point-by-point uh, -point rundown on the comparison between HydroCAD and TR20 and TR55. And this covers the different categories of uh, starting with, with runoff methodology and then working its way down through the different rainfall types that are supported, uh, how the time of concentration is calculated. Uh, so if you're familiar with the TR55 or TR20 approaches, then this table would probably be of use to you. It'll show you precisely how HydroCAD compares in, in some of these technical areas. Um, in general, you will find that there's a much wider range of capabilities available in HydroCAD. For example, there are extensive hydraulic calculations for weirs, orifice, culvert, and other devices, which you will not find in, in TR20 or TR55. So in many ways, it's a superset of the capabilities that you would see in those models. Uh, this does mean that the engineer who is setting up a HydroCAD model is responsible for deciding exactly which techniques they're going to use to model their site. Uh, you can't just say, I used HydroCAD. That doesn't answer the question as to how you set up your model. The engineer has to still choose between a wide menu of options and decide which of those are appropriate for a particular situation. As a reviewer, it also means you need to look at exactly how they've done each calculation. What rainfall did they use? What runoff method? How did they calculate their TC? There are a wide range of options available here, generally somewhat broader than you will find in, in the TR20 and, and TR55 solutions. So we will be looking at some of those calculations a little later as, as we uh, look at the, the detailed reports and output. So if you are someone who is submitting a HydroCAD project or, or receiving a project that has been analyzed with HydroCAD, uh, how is that information sent back and forth? Um, there are several ways it could be done. Um, one of the primary alternatives that would be available to you would be to send the actual HydroCAD project file. And so if we come in to look at a folder in which we've got some projects stored, uh, there is, in this case, a file called mountainview.hcp. The HCP is the extension for HydroCAD project file. And you can have project files stored wherever you like on your computer. And uh, this is the core file that contains all of the information that HydroCAD is going to use. These files are typically fairly small, 10K, uh, maybe up to 100K, something in that range. These files are easy to transfer by email. So you can just attach one of these to an email, and you can, in fact, open it as an attachment easily from an email. Uh, the advantage of having a HydroCAD project file is you can explore the full range of, of information and calculations that are contained within that project. Another option that's commonly used is to send a PDF file. And basically what you're doing is that the uh, person submitting or, or transmitting the information will be running the actual HydroCAD program and will generate a multi-page report containing pretty much all of the information from that project. And the easiest way to transmit that is to create a PDF file. And so this is just a, a series of pages. Uh, the PDF file is, is static, of course. You can't interact with it the way you can with the project file. But you, you can still structure it in a number of ways that we'll look at in order to make it as readable as possible. Your PDF files are generally going to be quite a bit larger. You'll notice we've got a PDF of about 300K versus about 10K for the original project file because the PDF has typically got graphics, tables, and, and other information. So those are, are two of the primary ways that people may, may transmit information to you. Um, I would certainly encourage people to, to, in many cases, they'll be sending both. They will send a, a printed report of some kind supplemented by additional information that the engineer has produced. But it's also very useful to have the actual HydroCAD project file because it allows a reviewer to drill into specific items on the project and hopefully answer additional questions themselves and, and save time in the overall review process. Whereas the reports are obviously static. You've only got the printed page that, that you have in front of you. Uh, if you are sending a HydroCAD project file to someone, uh, if they have HydroCAD, 
then they can open that file just by clicking the link. Let me just close this HydroCAD window that I have here. But if you just click that HydroCAD project file, it's opened like that for you in a HydroCAD window. If you don't already have HydroCAD installed on your computer, then there is a free HydroCAD sampler, which is available through our website. And you can download and install this, and it allows you to open and run calculations on any HydroCAD project. The sampler has certain restrictions because it is free. Specifically, it can just be run for 60 minutes per session, and you can't save projects of more than five nodes. But if you're on the reviewing or receiving end, you can restart it for any number of 60-minute intervals in order to spend as much time as you need to evaluating a project. And although you can only save nodes of up to, excuse me, save projects of up to five nodes, you can actually open a project of any size. So regardless of, of what edition of HydroCAD it's been created with, you can open it and look at those results with the sampler. So that tool is, is widely available. It's, again, that is free. That's commonly used by reviewers, educational agencies, students, uh, and people who are evaluating the software. And all the other capabilities of the software are there. So it's, it, it does let you do a complete review. So those options are available to you. Um, so, uh, many agencies do own full copies of HydroCAD, principally if, if they're doing their own design or modeling work. Uh, but with tough budget constraints, it's also quite feasible to use the sampler for that purpose. Uh, next, let's look in a little more detail at what's going on within a HydroCAD project. Uh, this file that I've just opened up, uh, when you open a HydroCAD window, the first thing that it shows you on screen is the routing diagram. And the routing diagram shows the interconnections of each of the elements in the model. Um, I'm not going to try to cover all of the detail here. There is, there's much that we could say, and we have many pre-recorded sessions that talk about the, the details of what's going on within HydroCAD. But very roughly, what you're looking at here are subcatchment areas. These are your runoff calculations. And then an outflow arrow, which comes down from each of those nodes. And this outflow arrow indicates exactly where that flow will be routed. And in this case, we have four different flows, which are all being routed to a reach. So the software will automatically combine. It will add those, those hydrographs in order to get the total inflow for the reach. And then that flow is being routed downstream to a pond in this instance with some additional contributing subcatchments. Uh, so that's the basic process uh, that is used. The, the routing diagram is, is handling all of the sequencing, so you don't have to provide commands to the software as to the, the order in which the calculation should be performed. Um, to look at results within a HydroCAD model, essentially all you need to do is come to an individual node, and you can either right-click that node and open a report window, or you can just double-click the node. And when you do that, HydroCAD automatically updates calculations to that point in the model. So in this instance, it's automatically updated the flows uh, for all of these contributing areas here coming into that particular subcatchment where we opened the report. If we were using a tailwater sensitive routing procedure, which we'll talk about a little bit later, then the model knows that that pond is also sensitive to tailwater, potentially, from these nodes downstream. And in that case, it will also evaluate this part of the project in order to get the tailwater that is influencing the pond. The point being, the software will automatically calculate whichever nodes are necessary to present an updated report for the current node that you're looking at. You don't need to worry about explicitly telling it to calculate those portions of the model. Uh, within the software, again, when we double click, we get a report window with, with updated calculations. And these report windows have several different tabs up top. Uh, the default is a hydrograph tab that we're looking at here. And this shows the inflows and outflows for that particular node. There can be multiple outflows for the node, principally uh, if a pond had several outlet devices that were being routed in separate directions. That's the reason that we would usually have multiple outflows. And all of those outflows will be shown over here on the right-hand side. The outflow 
item is the total outflow, and that's subdivided into a primary and a secondary outflow. And they are shown on the graph here with the same color coding. We also have labeled the peaks for each of these curves. And we can toggle this graph between a 3D and a 2D representation to give us a little bit more detail. And we can zoom in on any of these graphs by dragging a selection rectangle from upper left to lower right. And when we do that, it will zoom in over that particular portion of the graph. So we can do that repeatedly. We could toggle that back to a 3D view. And in order to reset that zoom, we would drag from anywhere in the lower right to upper left, the opposite direction, and it resets us to the original view of that graph. We can also look at the graphical information in a tabular form. If we click the table button, then it toggles over and shows us tables for, uh, in this case for a pond, the inflow, the storage, elevation, and outflows. And this is at each point in time through the routing calculation. One of the things uh, you'll notice here is there's some value shown in bold in this table. Uh, the bold indicates the highest or the maximum value in that particular column. You'll notice in this example that we have two values that are shown in bold. What that means is that the actual maximum value falls somewhere in between those two times. So here, our maximum storage is occurring somewhere between 13 and 14 hours. In order to get a closer look at what's going on in there, we come over to the shrink button, which is normally down. We pop that up and scroll down through our table. And now you can see that we have just a single value, which is shown in bold. So that is our maximum value. So there's our maximum storage, elevation, inflows, and outflows. Or outflows, excuse me. The inflow is still in this leftmost column. So you can, you can t change the shrink button in order to affect how many values are displayed. This is not have, does not have any effect on the actual routing calculations. This is just a matter of how the results are being tabulated. And the, the basic purpose of the shrink button is to reduce the number of points so it fits on a page or is a little easier to scroll through and, and get a quick overview. Uh, one of the things that's important to point out here, if we look at our maximum value here. Uh, if we look at our maximum outflow, we've got 23.16 is the maximum. These values are the actual flows calculated at each point in time during the routing. In addition to that step-by-step -step flow, HydroCAD also calculates a peak flow which is interpolated. The peak flow is interpolated by taking the three highest points on the hydrograph and fitting a curve in between those. And sometimes you can see that interpolation by zooming in. Now, this isn't a particularly good example because in this case it turns out that the highest value is, is occurring right on a, a tenth hour interval. But there may be other cases such as this outflow where you can see the maximum is slightly later at 3.51 hours. So here we have an interpolated flow of 10.92, uh, which may be slightly different. Uh, it's, it's very close in this case. But it, it, but it does interpolate. And so you need to be aware that the peak values are interpolated versus the maximum values shown in the table, uh, which are these flow at the specific calculation interval. So, so that's important to understand. Uh, if we, we've been looking just at the, the hydrograph tab at the moment. If we come back to the summary tab, the summary report gives us pretty much everything that's known about that particular node or pond in this case. And the very top of the summary uh, also gives us this information on our peaks. Uh, these values here are the interpolated peak flows. And then it tells us the exact time at which each of those peaks occurred and the total volume under the hydrograph. Uh, it's important to understand that the volume that's shown here is the volume of water that occurred during the span for this hydrograph. 
and we'll look at time span in a minute, but the user does have to set an appropriate time span for the calculations, and the volume is calculated within that period. Uh, if the time span is not sufficient to include the complete runoff or complete discharge from a pond, then the volume will be reduced. It will be truncated by nature of that, that time. So you do need to look at your volumes and understand the time span that's being used when, when assessing the, the, the uh, significance of that volume. I do urge you to look at your summaries in detail. The summary really has a very complete picture of what's going on with any particular node. And just read it from top to bottom and make sure you understand everything that's going on here. For example, for nodes that have an inflow, such as a pond, it tells us the inflow area. This is the total contributing watershed coming to this point in the system. It tells us how much of that is impervious and it tells us the effective inflow depth. So it's taking the volume of the inflow, dividing by the watershed area, and giving us an effective depth for that inflow. And in this particular instance, we happen to be looking at a 25-year event, which is what's selected in the event selector here at the top of the main screen. And then reading down through the report, we get the inflow, the total outflow, and then the breakdown of those outflows. Now, if you have questions about anything that appears on the report, then all you need to do is click on an item within the report window. Uh, the entire summary report is context sensitive, so you can click item by item and get additional information. So here we're looking at the summary portion of the report, and we can follow this link, and we can read more about peak flows and how those are determined. Uh, we can read about the time increment and the significance that has on the calculations, uh, and there's a discussion of the time span. So you can drill in to pretty much everything that's in the help system just from one of the report windows. So this is one of the values of uh, a reviewer having the actual HydroCAD project file, that it gives them this capability to drill in and understand more and, and answer their own questions about what's going on within the model. Uh, so continuing down through the report, the, the next section here is telling us what routing method was used in order to perform this particular calculation. Storage indication method is being used here. And then it tells us what time span has been specified, in this case 9 to 40 hours, and the time increment or DT of 0.1 hours, which is being used in this case. Next we have the peak elevation which was attained during the routing. Because it says peak, this is an interpolated peak. It's not just the maximum, not the highest single value, but, but interpolated from the three highest. So it might be slightly higher than the single highest calculated value. And it gives us the time of that peak, again, an interpolated time. And then we have corresponding values, such as the surface area and the storage that occur at this peak, peak elevation. Uh, in this instance, there's a flood elevation that's been entered. This is simply the point at which the software will issue a warning message to alert you that you've exceeded that level. And then it's tell the report is telling us the corresponding surface area and storage that's occurring at that flood point. The next two lines are the detention time within the pond. There are two procedures provided in HydroCAD, the plug flow method and the center of mass method for calculating detention time. And these procedures will provide very comparable results in many cases. You'll notice here we have 105 minutes versus 98. But there are some scenarios in which the results can differ, uh, essentially because the center of mass procedure is a simplified method for calculating detention time. And for cases that don't meet certain basic assumptions, then uh, you may want to use the plug flow method which is a somewhat more detailed procedure for calculating detention time. Again, the help system will give you information on those, those methods. The next portion of the report is our storage information. And in this case, we're just using custom storage, which has been entered. The user has essentially entered surface areas. And from those surface areas, the software is calculating incremental storage and accumulative storage. There's a whole range of different storage options that are available in HydroCAD, but whichever options have been selected, all of that information will appear in this part of the report. 
Scrolling down further, we get a table that shows the outlet devices that are being used on this particular pond. Each outlet device has a number. There's simply a table of outlet devices, and we have three devices in this particular case. And then this table gives us a description for each of those outlet devices over here. And the invert elevation, essentially the elevation where water begins to flow for each of those devices. And then the routing column is very important. The routing in column tells us how these devices have been coupled together. In this case, what the user is probably doing is that they have set up a riser structure or something of that nature. And the culvert is the primary outlet up here. So that's the final discharge device from the pond. And then they have, in this instance, a weir routed to device one. And what they're doing is that they're limiting the flow into the culvert with that weir. So they have a weir placed in front of the culvert. The secondary outflow indicates that this flow is being routed separately on the routing diagram. So this might be an emergency spillway, which is being routed separately. When you have a secondary outflow, you will see a separate red secondary outflow arrow which is what appears here. So, so this pond that we're looking at has two outflows, a primary outflow over here and a secondary. And those appear automatically based on the routing that's configured for those devices. Down the bottom of the report, the last item we get here uh, is this little flow diagram which shows that our primary outflow consists of the culvert device number one, which is in turn being fed by this orifice plate at the culvert inlet. And so these arrows show the sequence of the flow. Since we also have a secondary outflow, we get this separate section, and the secondary just consists of a broad-crested rectangular weir. But these sections will change dynamically, reflecting what the user has actually set up for outlet devices. So that, that is a basic out, uh, overview of a pond summary report. And again, you can see it's, it's quite readable. Just go through it, spend your time with it, click on any sections you may have more questions about. Now, based on the information that's been entered here, in addition to the inflow-outflow hydrographs, which we've looked at, we also have a stage discharge curve. And this is an analysis of the outlet devices that have been constructed for that particular pond. It shows us the discharge, for the primary, secondary, and even tertiary and discarded outflows as a function of elevation. And as with the hydrograph, this has a 3D and a 2D view and also a tabular version that we can look at in order to examine the stage discharge curve in more detail. The next tab is the stage storage information. This is showing us in blue the total storage for the pond versus elevation. And this is based on whatever uh, storage information the engineer has entered for the project. Then the, the next tab across is the events tab. Uh, at any given instant in time, HydroCAD internally has information flows for one set of rainfall conditions. And we can change the particular rainfall conditions using a drop-down selector at the top of the screen. So we could change from the 25 to the 10-year event. But on the events tab, we also have the capability to click the update button and get a table showing information for this node for all of the different return periods. So this is one of several ways it's available to us to, to get that information. The final tab for ponds is the sizing tab. And the sizing tab is designed to provide an estimate of the storage that's needed in a pond in order to attenuate the given, the, the current inflow to a given target level. And the way you would use this is to come over to the left axis, determine what your target flow is, which might be your pre-development flow, 10% more, 10% less, whatever your regulations require and then come over to the curve and then down to the bottom axis and that tells you the approximate storage required to attenuate your actual flow down to that target level. What's important to understand here is that the sizing report is just used to produce a initial estimate of how large your pond needs to be. The actual results and the routing calculations are not based on this sizing tool. They are based on the actual hydrograph routing through the pond.
So as a reviewer, you can probably just disregard the sizing report. If it's different and it indicates different results than what you're seeing in the actual hydrograph routing, that's not a problem. The actual hydrograph routing is the representation of what's happening in the model. Um, the, the final results are going to depend on the exact amount of storage, the shape of the storage, and most importantly, the nature of the outlet devices that have been defined for that pond. So all of that will come into play in determining how the pond actually behaves in, in any actual situation. So this is intended just to give you a brief overview of what's available in a report window for a pond. The other nodes have very similar report windows to this. The tabs and the content will differ. In the lower right hand corner of the screen, we do have a number of other buttons that are available to us. We've looked at a couple of those. Uh, we, we switched to the tabular view. We've looked at the 2D button. We can print this page. That's, that's pretty self-explanatory. We can also export this page to different formats. And then we can edit this particular node. And that's probably the most significant button here. As a reviewer, you may not be using that very much. But on the other hand, you may want to make some subtle changes and see what effects those have on the results. You can do that by clicking the Edit button. And then you can come across the tabs, and you can make changes to storage information, outlet devices, uh, even specify tailwater conditions, and other advanced parameters, such as the flood elevation, which has been specified in this case. One of the more important things often overlooked on the report window is the Notes tab. The Notes tab is designed to allow anyone preparing a report to provide comments to the reviewer. And I would strongly urge folks to use this screen um, to provide whatever information you can to help explain just what you're doing in this node. And when we have provided notes, that information appears at the very top of the summary for that particular node. So this initial information are the node notes that have been specified. And so put that in, explain to uh, your, your audience just what this node is for and what it's doing. You can do the same kind of thing as you're working within the node on individual parts of it. So for example, when you're setting up a storage definition, uh, rather than just leaving custom stage data here as a description, you could describe this as uh, reflecting pond or, or exactly what it might be on the model. Put in some descriptive information in order to help the, the reviewer understand what you're defining. The same goes for outlet devices. These all have a default description that will come up, such as culvert, but you can specify a custom description, as I've done here, orifice plate at culvert inlet. So I'm, rather than it just saying orifice, I'm indicating exactly what its role is in the model. So you can use these descriptions and the notes throughout in order to provide more information. Now, on this report window, there's a very important section here, which I haven't discussed yet. Uh, and that's these warning messages here. You notice we actually have two hints that have appeared. Uh, when calculations are done throughout any HydroCAD model, the software does a, a large number of different checks for your input data and from your results to look for potential problems. And those problems can generate messages which can be simple notes, hints, or warnings. They are progressively more serious in nature. And these messages all appear in a message window, which will appear on your screen. These appear as calculations are performed. And you can also click the Show All button to retrieve all of the hints and warnings for that particular project. So in this case, we have another number of hints in yellow. We also have a red warning message that's come up. We can click any of these items for more information. So we could click one of the hints and we get a little bit more information about this reach where we're exceeding the Manning's capacity. Or we could come to the warning, and here we have a reach where we have a pipe reach and we're detaining flow at the inlet. So we're, we've exceeded the capacity of the reach, and the message is suggesting that we really should be modeling this as, as a pond with a culvert outlet. So these are the kinds of situations that uh, anyone preparing a HydroCAD report or project needs to look at. Uh, they need to be alert to the, the warning messages. And as a general rule, the red warning messages need to be resolved. So as a reviewer, you seeing hints here is fine, although it's still worth understanding just what these hints mean. 
And even in the report, you can click on that item and it will bring you to the specific help topic for that particular hint. Hints are generally fine, just understand what's going on. Red warnings in most cases should be resolved, so there should not be a warning there. Um, in some cases there may be a warning, but it means that as a designer and a reviewer you need to understand what that warning means and the exact consequences of that uh, and assure yourself that the results are still acceptable and understandable even in the presence of that condition. But those messages are there to, to help bring attention to, to those situations, and make it easy to, to run a large model and, and have the items that you need to pay attention to highlighted for you. So again, those will show up in the summary report. If you receive a printed report of some kind, uh, let me just grab one of those. If someone has sent you a PDF report, then you're going to see page images uh, very similar to the, the screens we've been looking at. And uh, let me step through here. So here is a summary, for example, for subcatchment on the top of this page. And then down, so that's exactly as what you would see on the screen for the summary. And then below that we have the hydrograph. And so the, the pages can have many different options for content. Uh, we can tabulate the complete hydrograph in here. Uh, all of this can be set by the person running the HydroCAD model as to exactly what they want to include in the report. At the very beginning of the report, there are a number of tables which are very handy. Uh, by default, the routing diagram appears first, but then we have tables listing all of the sub areas within this particular project. Essentially, each separate ground cover and soil group is tabulated, and this tells us what subcatchments that ground cover combination is present in, and the total area and curve, curve number corresponding. Then there are tables listing each of our soil groups, uh, another table for ground cover broken down by soil group. So there's a number of different reports. You can even do a land use analysis if the user has chosen to do so. And there are reports listing all of the pipes in the model. And then an overall node listing, which is a concise listing of all of the nodes that make up that particular project. And then the report gets into the specific uh, summary and hydrographs for each of the nodes within the project. So the, the user of HydroCAD has an option as to which of those elements will be included in the report. But as you can see, those report elements mirror what we're looking at on screen when we have HydroCAD running. The project-wide reports are obtained through this button up top here for project report. Other reports are available just by double-clicking a node, but if we want project-wide reports, we come up here to the top of the screen, and here we have tabs that give us access to the node listing, the area listing, which is this ground cover and soil group combination, the soils on the site by, by soil group, land use analysis, a pipe listing, and finally, the notes for the project. So this shows us the notes that have been entered for each individual node, and we also have a capability to enter project-wide notes. So if we come up here to Project Notes, we can put notes in here for the overall project, and these will just appear at a heading page at the beginning of the notes listing. They appear here, and they'll also appear at the beginning of the PDF report on a separate page. So that's another way that a designer can add a narrative to a PDF report when they're transmitting it. So a number of different options there. Uh, let's just look briefly at what's going on in the other nodes. We've just looked at ponds so far. Let's look briefly at subcatchments, reaches, and links, just so you know what's, what's going on there. Uh, this particular subcatchment was set up as uh, to mirror example 3.1 in the TR55 manual. And if we double-click that node to open up the report window. We get the hydrograph as the default tab, but we can come over to the summary, and if we examine the summary, this shows you the basic information that HydroCAD is managing as far as runoff calculations. The first line up top is our runoff number. So there's our peak runoff, the time at which the peak occurs, and the total volume of flow. 
and total volume of runoff in this instance. And then that value is calculated to an equivalent depth, and that's done by taking the volume and dividing it by the area of this particular subcatchment to get an equivalent depth. Uh, if you wanted to cross-check a result here, you could take your curve number, and you could go back to the SCS and RCS runoff equation. You could plug in our total rainfall depth of 5.9 inches and the curve number of 71, and it would give you, hopefully, a depth of 2.82 inches. Uh, so that's the shortcut way that you can evaluate the SCS runoff equation. This is to demonstrate that the full runoff hydrograph that we've calculated here, once converted back to an equivalent depth, would give us the same number. So continuing down through our report window, uh, the, the next section shows us the runoff method that's being used. So we're using the SCS-TR20 method, the, the unit hydrograph procedure, which is certainly the most commonly used with HydroCAD. This also tells us the unit hydrograph being used, that we're using a standard SCS unit hydrograph, and it specifies the time span over which calculations are performed and the time increment that's being used. The next line is the rainfall, uh, that we are using a standard type 2 24-hour rainfall distribution, and that we have defined, in this case, a 100-year rainfall event with a depth of 5.9 inches. The, the rainfall settings are all specified on the calculation settings screen. If we come back to the toolbar and go to the calculator icon, this is where we'll find a tab for rainfall. This is where the rainfall is specified. Um, we may come back to this uh, in a couple of minutes if we have time. Uh, but whatever rainfall information is specified here will be displayed on the summary for each subcatchment. So when you look at the subcatchment report, right in this section, you're going to get a complete synopsis of, of the rainfall settings. You do want to be alert to what unit hydrograph is being used here. Is it the standard SCS unit hydrograph? Or perhaps are they using a Delmarva hydrograph or a custom unit hydrograph of some kind? So that will show up in your report. And then the rainfall distribution, often type 2, type 3 storm, although there are also custom regional storms that are specified by certain municipalities. And it's also possible to generate uh, your own synthetic rainfall distributions based on local NOAA or NRCC rainfall data. So there are a number of options here. And those options are growing now, so a little more attention will have to be spent, uh, devoted to assessing the exact rainfall data that's being used in any given project. Then coming down through the table, the next section we have here uh, are our curve numbers. So here are each of the ground covers that have been specified and the soil group and then the curve number, which is determined from the standard uh, SCS and RCS lookup table, and then the area for each of those curve numbers. Then we have a total area and a weighted curve number for the overall subcatchment. And then in this instance, we also have a report telling us that that's 100% pervious area. There's an option in the calculation settings as to whether or not HydroCAD gives you this line. Uh, you can turn it on and off. It's a, just simply a reporting of pervious and impervious areas. This line doesn't have any effect on the calculations. It's just a reporting function. But certain regulations do depend uh, or they are concerned with how much impervious area you have. So HydroCAD has the capability to report that, not only on a subcatchment basis, but on a project-wide basis. Then the next table is the list of TC flow segments within the subcatchment. So here we have a separate line, one for sheet flow, one for shallow concentrated flow, one for channel flow. And again, in this particular subcatchment, we're replicating an example from the TR55 manual. So you'll see the same input data and the same results that, that would have been obtained with that worksheet. This table can contain any number of flow segments, although here we're demonstrating a classic TR55 approach. There are additional TC procedures that are available to the user in HydroCAD. So uh, when someone says, I use HydroCAD, it, that does not tell you exactly how they calculated their TCs. They may have used the TR55 approach, or they may have opted to use uh, other procedures uh, in order to calculate the TC. 
whatever they've chosen, you will see that in, in this table. So that's the overview of the report summary report window for subcatchment. And once again, just a reminder, if you've got the actual HydroCAD project file, then you can click any item within that window, and it will bring you to the individual topics within the help system, right down to the equations that are used for each calculation. So you can find out a lot just by drilling in and, and clicking on, on the summary report. There are, once again, a hydrograph tab and an events tab, basically the same as the screen that we've just looked at for a pond. Uh, something that's worth mentioning here uh, on subcatchments, if we click the edit button on the subcatchment screen, then we have tabs that allow us to define each of the sub areas and the time of concentration and, and the notes. Coming back to the sub area, normally what a user would do would be to come to a given line in this table and then use the look up curve number button. And you can also get there just by double clicking a line. And this brings you to the standard lookup table from where they would choose the particular curve number. And click OK and the information is filled in on this table. We click OK again and, and the model is updated for that change. Now what I want to point out for both those preparing and reviewing HydroCAD projects is that it's also possible to enter values here directly. So if we have uh, five acres that someone just wants to call grass and assign it a curve number of 74 without going to the curve number table, lookup table, we click OK. That item is listed on the report, but you'll notice there's an asterisk that appears over here on the left-hand side. That asterisk is telling us that the information here was manually entered or edited in some manner. These two lines came straight up off the lookup table. So you're pretty much assured that these curve numbers are the authoritative values corresponding to ground covers in the table. But if they that description has been edited in any way, if the ground cover has been changed, if the curve number has been changed, or the user's put in a custom value, then an asterisk will appear in the left-hand column. So that's just a flag. It doesn't mean the result is wrong. It just means that the engineer has chosen to enter their own parameters. Uh, and we do see cases where people prefer to use their own categories for ground covers. Uh, so you just need to be aware of what that asterisk means and probably that a little bit more attention needs to be devoted to those lines, both when you're entering them and when you're looking at them as a reviewer. So that is a, a brief rundown of what's going on on the subcatchment node. Um, before we leave subcatchments, let's come back to the calculation settings, which is the calculator up here on the, the toolbar, and go to the rainfall tab. And it's just worth mentioning, HydroCAD includes a large library of rainfall distributions. And the, the NRCS type 2, 3 storms are perhaps the most commonly used, but there are a lot of other rainfalls that are available in HydroCAD. And we can click the View Storm button in order to bring up a storm distribution report. And with this window, we can look at not only an individual storm, but we can superimpose multiple storms. So here's a, a type 2 and a type 3 distribution superimposed showing the relative peak intensity of those storms. There's also an extensive library of other local rainfall distributions that have been developed for specific municipalities, and this screen gives you the capability to compare those and, and, and see how peak intensity and time of peak compare between one storm and another. You can also create custom rainfall distributions for use in HydroCAD, and when those are defined, they will also appear on, on this list and be available to select within the project. Just as a heads up, I, I mentioned before, we do now have the capability that you can use uh, local precipitation frequency data from NOAA or NRCC websites. And if you email that information to support at hydrocad.net, we can convert that to a synthetic rainfall distribution, essentially producing a local version of a type 1, 1, A2, or 3 storm for your location. And that capability, the conversion capability, will be built into the next HydroCAD release uh, in mid-2011. So that capability will be available to you directly. But at the moment, if you send us the files, we can create 
synthetic mass curves that you can use with all previous versions of HydroCAD. So you're going to be dealing with more different rainfall distributions as time goes on. So that is definitely going to present additional challenges for both designers and reviewers when they're looking at projects. But however that rainfall is set up, it will be selected right here on this screen. This screen also gives you the capability to look up rainfall events. So this uh, brings up a standard NRCS table, which allows us to come to a specific state and county and choose that line and click OK. And this will define the rainfall events for that particular location. This data also is constantly in flux. Um, there have been many amendments to the local rainfall tables. Uh, and since this was a nationwide table that NRCS produced, obviously it's very ambitious to try to keep that up to date. And so you will need to look at your local sources for rainfall information and make sure you're using appropriate rainfall depths. There are more capabilities that will be added to HydroCAD in the future, again, to pull in NRCS or NOAA data, or excuse me, NRCC or NOAA data, so that you can use that to directly define the events for a particular location. So it's going to get more and more specific as there are more online sources available for us to obtain rainfall information. Uh, other settings here that, that are important to be aware of because they can have a profound effect in your results, the antecedent moisture condition, uh, the default value of 2 is a normal condition, but you can also have a dry condition of 1 or, or a, a wet condition of 3, which will bump the curve numbers up or down and have a significant effect on your results. If anyone has changed that from the default, for example, if we were to bump that up to 3 and click OK, then back on our report window, it will tell us that this curve number has been adjusted based on the AMC. So it's taken a normal 68 curve number and bumped it up to 84. So you will be alerted to those things. Here's the AMC3 again next to the rainfall information. So there are quite a number of parameters that are not frequently used but are available to the user on the calculation settings. And certainly the antecedent moisture condition is one of those. Uh, another would be the unit hydrograph. The standard SCS unit hydrograph has a peak factor of 484 and that is used for most projects although there are other unit hydrographs that are available with different peak factors. And they can be selected on the screen by dropping down the list. And there is also a unit hydrograph report viewer, which you can use to view and compare the different unit hydrographs. And once again, if someone has selected a different unit hydrograph, such as Delmarva, you click OK. Back on the report window, it will tell us specifically that we are now using a Delmarva unit hydrograph with a different peak factor. So if you just read through your reports, they will tell you everything you need to know. Non-standard, non-default settings will be called out on the reports. So they give you a very complete look at, at what's going on within the project. Um, another important issue to look at is going to be uh, your rainfall uh, or calculation time span, as I mentioned briefly before. That is also specified on the calculation settings. What you normally want to do is make sure your time span starts early enough in order to include the earliest runoff from your project and that it runs long enough to consider at least your peak discharge and perhaps even the time it takes your ponds to empty completely. So the time span you use will depend on the specific project you're modeling and the intent of your model. Uh, you will get warning messages if your time span is perhaps inadequate. So for example, here with a curve number of 68, our runoff doesn't start until 10 or 11 hours. But if our curve number were larger than this, um, let me just get rid of these and just throw in 10 acres of curve number 98, putting it in manually. And now we have a yellow hint that's appeared down here that a longer time span is advised for full volumes. Because what's happening is that we have some runoff that's already started at the nine hour mark. We're not seeing that. We're not actually including that in the model. And so the hint is alerting us to that condition. The rest of this hydrograph is fine, but the total volume will be lower than you might expect because of this truncation. So if we would go 
to the calculation settings and go to time span, we could start our time span earlier. Let's set it to five hours, perhaps. And that helps, but with a curve number of 98, the runoff's actually starting very soon, close to the zero hour mark. So this is a situation where we might even need to start right back at zero hours. And when we start back at zero, now you can see we're capturing the entire amount of the, the runoff, which is starting at around the two hour mark. Again, you will see hints or warnings in the reports that will alert you to these conditions. But the, re the choice of the time span is an important parameter. Similarly, there's the choice of the time increment or time step which is being used, and this is roughly related to the time of concentration. The shorter your time of concentration, the shorter the time increment will be needed. And the software will look at these values for you. There is a warning message that will alert you if a shorter TC is appropriate. So that is a, a brief look at, at some of the subcatchment issues. Uh, you will find additional web pages uh, on our website on each of these. We have pages that discuss common runoff issues, peak factor and unit hydrograph in, in this instance, uh, discussions of the shape of hydrographs, uh, why we get no flow early in the storm. Uh, we also have the same kind of information on ponds, reaches, and, and links. Uh, we haven't had time to talk about reaches and, and links here, but just very quickly so you know what they are. A reach is used for routing a hydrograph through an open channel. A reach assumes normal open channel flow. Uh, in this instance, we've actually got a reinforced concrete pipe model as a reach. That would be okay if this is an oversized pipe such that we never fill the pipe and we can assume normal open channel flow. But a uh, reach will not look at entrance loss coefficients, and so for that reason, we generally recommend that pipes be modeled as a pond with a culvert outlet. And when we open up that reach report, we do get this hint at the top. That te it's telling us, reminding us, that inlet and outlet conditions are not being evaluated for a reach. And so we, we need to be aware of that, and if this is a pipe, then we may want to model this as a pond with a culvert outlet. The pond with culvert outlet is able to handle submerged inlets, tailwater conditions, and, and a wide range of additional situations beyond what we can do with a pipe reach. And then the last node here is a link. And a link is used for introducing a flow from other sources. This might be an off-site flow that we need to represent in our model. And it might be that we are given a hydrograph that's been produced by another study. We could use a link to enter that manually or even to import that from a spreadsheet or from another HydroCAD project. So there are various purposes for a link. But basically, it's to introduce that, that flow that has been defined elsewhere. Uh, the last item worth mentioning uh, is tailwater conditions. The, when you set up a HydroCAD model initially, it will use a default routing method, the storage indication method, for doing the routing. The storage indication method is this the standard procedure used in uh, TR20, TR55, and this uh, is a very stable procedure, but it is not able to respond to tailwater situations within your model. We do recommend you start with the storage indication method as a default, and HydroCAD will check your tailwater conditions at every point in the model at each time step. If there is a potential tailwater dependency, then you will get a hint or a warning to alert you to that. And if you read more carefully in the background information on that warning, it will basically recommend that you switch to an alternate routing procedure, such as the dynamic storage indication method, which is capable of responding to tailwater. Again, if any of these limitations are exceeded, you will see warnings within the model to alert the designer and the reviewer. And we have a lot of information on our website, again, discussing different routing methods and tailwater. We had previous webinars that have discussed uh, routing procedures and tailwater in some detail, so you can certainly go back and look at those. But our purpose here is just to alert you to the, the, the signs that you should be looking for as a reviewer uh, when you are going over a project in order to help you assess that this model is completely and properly accommodating the, the situations that you're dealing with on this site. So 
That's our content for today. I, I thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you have further questions, certainly do email us at uh, support at hydrocad.net, and this session will be posted on our site later today if you want to view it again or, or others in your, your organization would like to benefit from this content. So I thank you very much, and I hope that uh, you will join us for a future session in our HydroCAD webinars. Thank you, and have a great day.